This video is an outreach of Unity Christian Church, 5255 South London Road, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Version and commentary is from Feasting on the Word. Editing and music from the public domain by George Etheridge. Our subject today is thank offerings. Our scripture is from Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses one through 11. And it reads, when you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hands and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God. You shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramine was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in numbers, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our afflictions, our toil and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O oh Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. These days, it's hard to know how we ever got along without computers and cell phones. You know, a generation has now emerged that never knew a world without these appliances. We live in a world where the wisdom of the past is easily trumped by the latest bid for our loyalty. Are we the happy slaves of new technologies? To whom do we belong? This Deuteronomy passage provides us an important perspective. There is the giving of the first fruit of the harvest and then a recitation of the story of deliverance. These are inseparable in this passage, suggesting that the meaning of our thanksgiving and the recitation of God's act of liberation are also inseparable. 
Imagine this. After 39 years, 11 months, and one week in the wilderness, the Israelites are gathered on the plains of Moab, poised to enter the promised land. After nearly 40 years of feeling lost and unsure, having had to learn a mountain of laws and rules, after being chastised for bad behavior, often well-deserved, and after having spent a good deal of their sojourn being confused, underfed, and poorly housed, wondering why in the world they left Egypt in the first place. Here, they sit on the highlands, overlooking the Jordan River Valley, the promised land, lying in the distance. Everything they have endured, worked, and sacrificed for is at long last within their reach. The sense of God's grace and blessing in return for their faithfulness must have been overwhelming. The first fruits are to be gathered in the new land. The tradition that emerged in Israel was that at the barley crop uh, reaping around Passover, the official harvest began and continued for another two months as other fruits matured. The first ripe fruit on any tree was picked and offered with a ribbon tied around the branch at the temple. They are instructed to offer a harvest crop in worship because the community not only has access to fertile ground, but that that land has been settled. Up until this moment, the people of Israel were wanderers without a land of their own. They were a people who lived in tents. Israel's ancestor, Jacob, and through him, Abraham, was a wandering Aram. Aram, Aram. <laughs> That means they came from Northern Syria. From this long legacy, painfully underscored by those 40 years in the wilderness, the people have come to this moment when they are about to settle in their own land. Possessing land is the necessary prerequisite for any offering of first fruits. It is the emotional and spiritual taproot of what the offering means. God has instructed them to be the tenants and the caregivers of the land. And God promises to give the first fruit. This act of worship requires trust and recognition of God's abundance. Our scripture is about this act of gratitude for God's particular grace that ends in a celebration whose embrace extends beyond Israel's own life to the aliens who reside among them. It describes a moment that is rooted in memory, shaped by a journey and defined by joy. In rehearsing this story and affirming that today a declaration has been made, 
I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. They are confessing that the faithfulness of God to Israel is based on their own life, not on their own life, but the provisions by which they may now voice their own gratitude and even claim this story as their own. As George Herbert noted in his poem about Israel's struggles at entering the promised land, their story pins and sets us down. That is, their story reads those who remember and retell it, marking us by the same journey and shaping us by the same faithfulness. For Israel, memory was often the mother of faith the way God's promises were rehearsed and named and claimed anew. To remember like that was not simply to rummage through archived documents. You see, the genealogies and the stories identified Israel as belonging to the God who, in Calvin's words, never forsakes his people in the middle of the journey and whose grace makes of such memories the stuff on which faith feeds. There are more than faint echoes of this passage in the words that celebrate another bill by which God's people are fed. You know, Do this in remembrance of me. In any case, this journey marks us as people of a particular way. The church dares to confess its faith because on this journey, the church believes that God has drawn near to us. God has spoken to us. God has even made provisions for us out of the abundance of God's own life. Like a love letter, the church does not hunt up an excuse for confessing its love or expressing its gratitude. Rather, it risks speaking the foolishness of love because it is convinced it has heard the language of love in God's passion and compassion for God's people. The church confesses its faith by confessing that it has been loved and thus has been liberated from the hell of self-absorption into the freedom of life as God's gift, the freedom to welcome the alien who resides in our midst as gifts, the freedom to know God on the basis of God's extravagant, unwarranted, even surprising self-giving. And for this, we give thanks. So what are we to say about all this? That the journey of these Lenten weeks means that we really have to think long and hard about our story, that we have to practice some daily or weekly discipline to keep that story ever fresh, that we have to work harder to be more sincere Christians, or that we have to give more practice more effective self-restraint? Is that the journey that this scripture describes and to which Lent beckons us? Or is this text really about the celebration of God's abundance 
to a wandering people and others who are confused, to folks who live in a strange land and find themselves oppressed by hard taskmasters, to folks who feel trapped in impossible situations, yet find themselves surprisingly delivered to folks who are struggling clumsily to say thank you with their lives. The provisions of our God who never abandons us on the journey are according to this text, bountiful. That is why it is so important for the church, especially at the beginning of Lent, to undertake thanksgiving and worship. This story in Deuteronomy ends in celebration and praise, which through its long and winding way, Lent prepares us also to offer. This is a time of singing and a way of offering thanks and praise to the one who will not let even death silence God's love for this world. What happens to our sense of self in history when our priorities are organized around material possessions and the shifting stock market, we may no longer know why we give thanks or to whom we give it. Our identities as God's people delivered from bondage may be lost so that certain acts of thanksgiving even become meaningless. Hence, our passage of scripture is relevant to an understanding of ourselves as human beings who are the subjects of God's continual care and creative love. Our scripture may help us counter the illusion that we can deliver or save ourselves through our own technologies. Deuteronomy knows that when a people forget their past, they lose their present and future. Celebration and recitation are ways that we fashion our identity as people of God. Have you ever known people who seldom say thank you or express a sense of gratitude for the things done for or given to them? Some live as if they are entitled to the goodwill of others. Lent, the season of the church, is an opportunity to reverse this way of being in the world. It is a time to take stock of our life and that of our community to remember the unmerited good that has come our way and to repent of the wrongs we've done. In this way, we express gratitude by opening our lives to examination, purification, and correction. We express gratitude by seeking to live in right relationship with God and the world and even with ourselves, developing and expressing the attitude of gratitude then can become a spiritual discipline in our lives. We give thanks as we remember our ancestors. These ancestors are the particular individuals who stand out as exemplary figures for whom, for us, and they have gone before us. 
These may be treasured friends or beloved relatives or others who left their imprint on our lives and the lives of the community. Our gratitude extends to them because through their faith, they still speak and encourage us to work for a better world. We are challenged to remember global oppressions and the ancestors who resisted them. The work of our ancestors is therefore through our faithful efforts. We give thanks in remembering the past. The past represents the events that shaped us directly and indirectly in recognized and unrecognized ways. We must struggle to remember the past so that we can learn the lessons of history and move toward a future with a greater sense of wisdom and appreciation. When we ignore the past and fail to learn the lessons of history, then we're likely to repeat past tragedies on a different scale. When we do not learn from the past, the future becomes the past revisited. What if we are set free to offer thanks? What if this bounteous God really is near us, offering joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us, keeping us in God's grace and guiding us when perplexed? freeing us from all ills in this world and the next. Not to give thanks in the company of this God would be to fail miserably in understanding where Lent seeks to take us. It would be to starve ourselves in our own sufficiencies rather than taste the banquet that has been prepared. Why not rather offer to God our thanks? Why not sit and eat? Each Lent season, we are, we can thoughtfully revisit the legacy of the cross and the defining miracle it wrought for each of us as Christians. Once again, we seek to ready ourselves for the inbreaking of God's radical grace and abundance. Our scripture is a valuable summary of the story of God's promise of fulfillment for Israel after 40 years of desert wandering with faithfulness, with covenant and abundance. At the beginning of this Lenten season, this passage from Deuteronomy provides an important perspective. Despite our spiritual wandering, God has remained faithful and through Christ's sacrifice has brought us in grace to a land of spiritual milk and honey. Yet our failures to sometimes remember this truth puts us at risk of squandering our remarkable inheritance. How might we be more worthy of God's abundant grace and love that the good news of Easter lies before us? What remembering might we do? What thank offering might we give? My brothers and sisters, we invite you to believe the good news of God's abounding love in Jesus Christ. 
by confessing faith in Christ and being baptized into his church, you and I receive new life in the spirit. So we invite you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for, for providing the way of faith and salvation. We thank you for allowing us to be your children through our faith and our baptism and our willingness to accept you as our Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us of our journey and what you have saved us from. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us lessons from the past that we can learn from, that we can model our spiritual walk with. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of your mission and ministry. Lord, we confess that we depend on you. We trust you, Lord, for our daily walk and for our salvation. We ask you, Lord, to teach us to be more faithful in the ways we treat one another and everyone that we meet and the things we say and do. Lord, protect us and guide us and forgive us, especially for those times when we neglect to do the things that you have called us to do. We ask that you replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sickness with your healing. Replace our anxiety with your peace and your hope and your love. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen.